So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to an historic day and an announcement here uh, in the province. My name is Derek Mumberkett. I'm Nova Scotia's Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development and the MLA for Sydney Whitney Pier. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. It's a pleasure to be here today with our federal guests, Prime Minister Trudeau, thank you for being with us. Minister Hussein, thank you for being with us today. And my provincial, uh, Premier uh, Rankin, sir, it's an honor to be here with you. Minister Jordan, it's an honor to be here with you. And of course, one of our special guests, Dr. McIsaac, thank you for being with us today. So we'll move right to it. At this point, I would like to ask my friend, uh, my new friend, we've uh, had many conversations over uh, the last number of months. I joke with him saying that we, we kept some of our negotiations between intermissions during the, the playoffs, but uh, I've, you, know, you make friends along the journey and your leadership, I want to thank you uh, and your staff for getting Nova Scotia to this point today. So Minister Hussein, I will pass uh, the floor over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Mumbuket, for that kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Merci de vous joindre à nous pour cette annonce qui, qui uh, va marquer l'histoire de la Nouvelle-Écosse pour des générations à venir. Thank you all for being here today for an historic announcement that I know will bring outstanding results for families in Nova Scotia. I can simply not overstate the significance of this announcement today. And I'm proud to be here with all of you, inclu including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, my federal colleagues and friends, and provincial colleagues as well. Uh, and if uh, you didn't think that this was a team effort before, you know that it is now. Just look at that screen. So many faces and so many wonderful people that contributed immensely to get us here. And we all agree, we all agree on the importance and the need for a Canada-wide early learning and childcare system that simply leaves no child behind, that includes all families of all backgrounds and all regions. And I can say with confidence that working alongside Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and our entire team to make this a reality for families in Nova Scotia will be single-handedly one of the most important things that I will ever work on in my entire life, and I'm very proud of that. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. You know, with, uh, with daycare centers uh, closed uh, as a result of the pandemic and feeling the pressures of the pandemic, but even before that, uh, far too many parents, especially women with children, have had to make a difficult choice between staying at home to take care of their kids and going back to work to provide them. But what kind of choice is that? It's not really a choice. I just visited the East Preston Daycare Center, just like many other childcare centers that I've been to across the country. And when you talk to uh, childcare providers, when you talk to parents, they will tell you that they're facing issues uh, like long wait lists, affordability issues, making sure that uh, daycare centers are accessible to kids of all backgrounds. And just this morning, uh, East Preston Daycare Center folks were telling me, if they had more investments, they would be able to look at all the parents in the eye who are on wait lists, and they would be able to offer them a safe, accessible, high quality, and affordable childcare space. And they're looking to us for a solution. Parents also uh, struggle to find spots that work for them and their reality every day. Since our arrival in the government, we knew that we had to do more. Why uh, we knew that not only we, did we have to speak up for these families, but that we as a government had to step up for these families. Since 2017, our government has invested $46 million in early learning and childcare in Nova Scotia through a bilateral agreement on early learning and childcare. But there is absolutely more work to be done. And we all know that. And that is where the Canada-wide early learning and childcare system comes in. A high-quality system that is both affordable, accessible, 
high quality and inclusive childcare, a system that leaves no child behind, a system that gets us to $10 a day in childcare fees in five years, and a system that will enable all families to experience a, a reduction of childcare fees in half by the end of next year. Because we know there is simply no more time to waste. Notre plan, our plan, notre plan est ambitieux, mais pas our, impossible. Um, is ambitious, but not impossible if we work with our partners to get it done. Plan. But we can do it. We can do it by working together with the nonprofit sector, by working together with provinces and territories, and everyone who has made uh, this day possible. And listen, our kids are growing fast. They're growing way too fast. I know my, my three young boys, when I look at them, I can't believe they're growing into fine young men, and I, I, I don't know where the time went. So our kids need affordable, accessible, inclusive, and high-quality early learning and child care, and they need that now. I know every parent wants to look back in the early years of their kids, and they want to make sure that they provided the best possible chance at success for their children. And this is what this is about. It's about building a system that will get us there. It is about building a system that will contribute to the better Canada that we all aspire to. And on that note, I really want to turn to the most um, ambitious and strongest champion for Canadian families. Someone who believed that a vision of $10 a day childcare is not only something to aspire to, but th that it is something to be to, to partner with provinces and territories and that can be delivered and turned into a reality sooner rather than later. He's been working tirelessly to make sure that we deliver affordable, accessible, inclusive, and high quality early learning and childcare for Nova Scotia families. Please join me in welcoming my friend and leader, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Thank you, Ahmed. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, I want to begin by addressing the news that more unmarked graves have been found near a former residential school in BC. My heart breaks for the Penelica tribe and for all Indigenous communities across Canada. I recognize these findings only deepen the pain that families, survivors, and all Indigenous peoples and communities are already feeling, that they reaffirm a truth that they have long known. To members of the Penelica tribe, we are here for you. We cannot bring back those who were lost, but we can and we will continue to tell the truth. Just like we will continue to work in partnership with Indigenous peoples to fight discrimination and systemic racism with real, concrete actions. I'm joining you from Ottawa today on traditional Algonquin territory, but it's great to see that Ministers Hussein and Jordan, as well as MP Jeff Regan uh, and so many other of our friends, are there in person for this important announcement. Uh, so I want to give a big shout out to our outstanding Nova Scotia caucus joining us virtually. And of course, I'm very happy to be joined by Premier Rankin and Minister Mombriquet. It's great to see you both. I'm really looking forward to being back in Nova Scotia again. It's been far too long. I got out uh, across the country a little bit last week, but uh, uh, look forward to making it to Atlantic Canada and engaging with all of you. Premier Rankin and Dr. Strang have, have uh, done an awful lot to finish the fight against COVID-19. I know that tough decisions often had to be made, but that the safety of people was always top of mind. Nova Scotians have worked hard through this pandemic and have always looked out for each other. The sacrifices made have paid off as we're seeing fewer and fewer cases and brighter days ahead. Vaccination rates are increasing quickly with more than 82% of eligible people in Nova Scotia with at least one dose and more than 45% fully vaccinated. On the national scale, we've hit an important milestone today in our efforts to protect Canadians from COVID-19 as soon as possible. Almost 80% of eligible Canadians have now received their first dose and more than 50% have received their second dose. Beyond our borders, we continue to do our part to ensure that everyone everywhere has access to COVID-19 vaccines because to end this pandemic anywhere, we have to end it everywhere. Yesterday, we announced that we're stepping up our support to help vaccinate the world with a donation of 17.7 million AstraZeneca doses through COVAX. 
Canadians can also help us deliver these life-saving vaccines to the world. That's why our government is teaming up with UNICEF Canada. By texting the, texting the word vaccines to 45678, you can donate $10 to help somebody else in the world get a vaccine, and the government of Canada will match your donation. Canadians have always shown generosity in times of crisis, and there's never been a time like today to help and give a vax. I'm really happy to see many families uh, in the background today. I know uh, these past months, this past year and a half, has been really difficult on an awful lot of parents, uh, on an awful lot of kids, but especially for moms. Uh, as we've seen the challenge of uh, working even via Zoom, uh, with kids at home, uh, not being able to go to childcare, not being able to go to school, uh, it has caused real pressure on families and highlighted what families and, quite frankly, what liberals have always known, which is childcare is not just a social program, it's an economic program. So as parents, you've had a lot to juggle during this pandemic. But on top of that, the lack of affordable, high-quality childcare has made difficult and sometimes impossible choices. Well, from the very beginning of the pandemic, I made a promise, we made a promise, that we'd have your back. And what we learned clearly through this pandemic is part of having your back doesn't just mean delivering vaccines and keeping people safe and delivering PPE, which we've done. It doesn't just mean supporting small businesses, supporting workers, supporting people across the country. It also means recognizing that this is a she session, that women were hit harder than many other groups, uh, many other people during this pandemic. And we need to step up as we learn the lessons from this pandemic and build back better. And that's why I heard from parents right across the country how important it is to move forward on childcare and that the business community finally stepped up and says, yes, please move forward on childcare as well, um, is really, really exciting. So parents uh, that I've heard from all across the country, and indeed parents, I know uh, Sean, I see Sean Fraser on this, uh, on this Zoom. Uh, Molly's uh, getting into, into grade school now, but uh, the new baby, Jack, very excited. Uh, congratulations to Sean and Sarah on that. Uh, I know childcare is really something that's on your mind. Uh, and Ian, Premier Rankin, I know you and Mary are also thinking about that. That's gonna be exciting for, uh, for the coming fall. Uh, but it's not just about uh, people who have uh, you know, choices and luxury, uh, it's opportunities for everyone to be able to get that high quality, affordable childcare, which is not a luxury, which is a necessity right across the country. And this is particularly true for women who knew, too long have known that good childcare is essential to building a successful career. As we're trying to build back better, we have to ensure that uh, mothers and families have access uh, to high quality and affordable daycare. It's important for our children to live a rich experience in daycare. It's also important for our economy to allow more women to be in the labor market. And therefore, we're undertaking concrete measures in order to afford an opportunity for everybody to succeed, and we're taking uh, concrete steps so that our relaunch be feminist. The early learning and child care system is now. Just last week, we took a big leap forward in making that goal a reality by signing a historic early learning and child care agreement with British Columbia. And today, I'm excited to announce that an agreement was signed with the government of Nova Scotia to make childcare more affordable for families in the province. As part of the agreement, in the next five years, we'll work with the provincial government to achieve an average of $10 a day childcare for all regulated spaces for kids under six. By the end of next year, average childcare fees will be cut in half. For families here with young kids, this will make a huge difference. Within two years, we're going to create 4,000 new spaces and 9,500 more over the next five years. This is real change you can count on. 
Today's announcement shows that governments from coast to coast to coast can come together and deliver real progress for Canadian families, no matter where they live. We're focused on building the right foundations for a community-based and truly Canada-wide system of childcare. In Nova Scotia, this includes growing quality spaces in the not-for-profit childcare sector, creating inclusive childcare spaces, and supporting the recruitment and retention of qualified childcare workers. These are key to the long-lasting success of this plan. I'd like to take a moment here to thank the people who are working in the daycare sector. Your contributions were essential to the creation of this plan. Thank you for having continued to demand better uh, services and know that this is just the beginning. You will always uh, be welcome around the table as we continue to work for a better system. A better future for families and for our economy. Creating a strong early learning and childcare system represents a way to build communities and the most effective step we can take to support our economy in the short, medium, and long term. It's about making sure that everyone has the same access to opportunities, even from their youngest age. Let's continue to work together to make Canada the best place to be a child and to raise a child. And before I end today, I want to once again thank Premier Rankin and his team for their tremendous collaboration on this file. Ian, I can remember our very first phone call when you'd just gotten elected as Premier, where you made it clear that child care was a top priority. You've always been a strong partner in making this ambitious goal a reality. And this is a game-changing policy for families in Nova Scotia and continues to set a high bar right across the country while ensuring fairness, equity, and inclusion to get more women in Nova Scotia and across the country into the workforce. Thank you all. Merci, mes amis. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for, for your leadership. Today's announcement is going to change the lives of families forever. And uh, we look forward to having you back in Nova Scotia. And I look forward to having you in Cape Breton when the time comes. So uh, I'll put a plug in for the island. Um, I want to recognize, too, that the, my, co my caucus colleagues who are online uh, with us virtually today, uh, I want to thank them all for the support uh, that they have provided to get us to today. Uh, as a government, uh, we, uh, we've made many important decisions as a government over the years. This is one of the most important we will ever, we will ever make. I also want to recognize that my colleague, uh, Minister Patricia Arab, uh, is in the crowd today. So, Patricia, thanks for being uh, with us in person. I also want to thank Dr. Lumpkin, who's here. Thanks for inviting us uh, to your beautiful institution uh, for today's announcement. And, and thank you to, your, to, your, to the ECEs here and ECEs across the province for the work that they do uh, every day. So um, the next speaker, um, I was a little surprised uh, when he made, he, he, he made the call to me and told me I was going to be the Minister of, of Education and Early Childhood Development, which uh, has been an honour, but, but this has been our conversation from day one. Uh, Premier Rankin has been uh, a, a huge advocate for ensuring that, that everyone in the province, no matter where they live, uh, no matter uh, their socioeconomic status, that everybody had the same opportunity, that every child had the same opportunity, and that every family had the same opportunity to provide uh, that support for, for the child. So, Premier, uh, you're, 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 you're a big reason why we're here today. When the federal government came forward with, with their plan, we knew that we could move quickly uh, to ensure that uh, we, could, we could put a plan in place here in the province because families have been waiting for it for a long time. So, sir, uh, congratulations. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership on this file, and I will now pass it over to you. Thank you, Minister Marmarkat and Minister Jordan, Dr. McIsaac, and to all the guests here. This is a really big day. It's hard to, to really grasp the, the magnitude of what these uh, decisions will mean for future generations of this province. I want to thank uh, Minister Hussain for traveling here to Nova Scotia. It's a sure sign that we're on the road to recovery here in Nova Scotia when we can start to welcome Canadians from different provinces and ministers here for announcements. 
it's hard to beat this uh, in terms of uh, the sheer uh, number of the, the investment that's happening here. I've been making a lot of uh, recent announcements, as uh, many of the media remind me, but it's hard to beat this one uh, today. So thank you to the Prime Minister for joining us here, zooming in today. It's great to see you, and, and I hope that you're able to get to Nova Scotia soon uh, to visit our beautiful province. I want to personally thank you for your contribution, not only for today's announcement, but for helping us manage the pandemic and helping Nova Scotians get through a very difficult period of time. We certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it the way that we did without such tremendous support from the federal government for capacity in our testing strategy and especially the vaccine rollout. The amount of supplies and the amount of volume of that robust supply that we've heard Dr. Strang saying that we needed to keep Nova Scotia safe is only possible because of the delivery of the federal government. So thank you for that. This is an important day and I am announcing that we are bringing affordable childcare to this province. And as the Prime Minister said, this isn't just strong social policy, but it is a strong integral part of how we grow a more inclusive economy. It's undoubtedly a landmark deal for Nova Scotia. And I want to thank the Prime Minister and his government for being such supportive partners on this and many issues facing our province, like climate change. We are on the campus of Mount St. Vincent University at the Child Study Centre. And thank you to Ramona Lumpkin for being our host today. And I know a lot of children have benefited from the child care program, as you can see behind me, and the great educators who are pro providing that strong foundation for learning. I'm actually a proud graduate myself of the business program here at Mount St. Vincent, an appropriate location for today, with Mount's values of the advancement of women and girls inspired by a strong tradition of social responsibility. And as uh, the Prime Minister spilled the beans, I am going to become a father in November, so I, I have some catching up to do to, to Sean on the line there, but uh, certainly I think uh, centres like this will be a, a larger part of my life uh, moving forward. Affordable childcare will benefit thousands of working families, no doubt, particularly women and children in our province. And I think I can speak on behalf of all of my Liberal colleagues how pleased we were to see the commitment in the recent federal budget. And we're eager to start discussion, and we were eager at the time to start discussions, as I said in the House and in subsequent interviews, to see how we could deliver on a program here in Nova Scotia. It will improve the lives of many Nova Scotians and provide new opportunities for those who have struggled to keep working or were not able to work because of the costs and availability of childcare. It also recognizes the work that early childhood educators provide to the children of our province, our future. I entered politics to help people. I ran for Premier to ensure that this province is fair and equitable and better leverages the talents of everyone. And we are getting closer to that goal every day. The evidence, all of the research, points to the benefits of early learning for children and their future success. And this, this announcement will become a strong uh, foundation of our economic plan as we emerge from this pandemic stronger. We know that every dollar that's invested in this sector returns six dollars to the economy. Just like what our pre-primary program has done for four-year-olds. So we can help more children get a good start at life, no matter their socioeconomic status or where they live. And it means more women will be supported to enter or re-enter the workforce or go back to school. Our $40 million commitment over five years will leverage a historic federal contribution to provide affordable childcare that is high quality and inclusive. As a result, next year, families will pay 50% less for regulated childcare, and by 2026, childcare will cost an average $10 a day in Nova Scotia. Our efforts don't stop there. We will create thousands of new spaces, enhance before and after school programming, and more support for our hardworking early childhood educators. In partnership with the federal government, we have created a workforce strategy with pathways for early childhood educators to advance their skills and increase salaries. We are creating pathways for opportunities for African Nova Scotians, Mi'kmaq, Indigenous, Francophones, and newcomers to enter the early childhood education program and stay here. With federal support, we are offering free tuition and books for 300 childcare staff so they can upgrade their ECE skills. We're also offering 300 bursaries for current students to help offset the cost of their education. 
We are undertaking a compensation wage review so we can ensure ECEs are paid appropriately. And finally, to recognize the hard work of our trained ECEs, we are providing a one-time grant of $500 for trained ECEs who work in provincially funded childcare centres as we undertake this important work. What we have announced today is a major transformation of our childcare sector, and it will provide generational benefits to this province. Again, I want to thank Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Hussein, Minister Jordan, Dr. McIsaac, my minister, Derek Mumbercat, also the, uh, the MLAs that are on the screen, but we have one for the riding here, Patricia Arab and MP Jeff Regans here, the two in-person uh, representatives, and uh, all the best to Jeff. I know he's not running in the next election, so I'm sure he's proud to... to I know he was around in all other uh, childcare discussions over many, many years, so uh, I'm sure he's proud to, to be here for this. Together, we have crafted a partnership that will benefit generations of children. Today, we are ensuring that every single child in Nova Scotia has a more equitable, equitable beginning to their life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Premier Rankin, and uh, congratulations. I haven't had a chance to really see you, but... Uh, as, as the dad of, uh, of two girls, uh, six and five, you're going to get busy, busier than you think. Um, so, so at this point, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, and I really appreciate you being with us today, uh, Dr. McIsaac. Dr. Jesse Lee McIsaac is an assistant professor at the Mounds Child and Youth Study, fa uh, with the, uh, Mo the Mounds Child and Youth Study faculty, as well as a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in early childhood. She's also a mother of two, whose son attends the centre, and is joining her today. So Dr. McIsaac, I'll pass it over to you. It's an honor to be here among distinguished guests and our friends at Mount St. Vincent University's Child Study Center, which is in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We all want the best for our children. There is well-established research that tells us that the early years of a child's life is foundational in lifelong learning, health, and well-being. Accessible, affordable, inclusive, and high-quality early learning and child care programs are critically important in achieving these goals we have for our young children. I am a Canada Research Chair in Early Childhood, Diversity and Transitions. My team at the Early Childhood Collaborative Research Centre at Mount St. Vincent University studies the ways in which we can enhance well-being during early childhood. My research focuses on leveraging family voice to inform early childhood related policy and ensure that families and their children have access to the supports that they need. We know that there are families in Nova Scotia who are marginalized by historical trauma poverty, and lack of access to culturally relevant programs and services. We have heard through my research the importance of addressing systemic barriers, including the financial challenges of childcare. High quality, culturally responsive early learning and childcare that is affordable for Nova Scotian families is so vital. To achieve these goals, we need to support training and diversity among our early childhood educators and then in turn acknowledge the value of their work by providing them with fair compensation and benefits. I'm also a parent of two young children and have seen and felt the impact of quality childcare that is led by highly educated and trained early childhood educators. As a parent and a board member of the Child Study Center, I have such appreciation and confidence in the work of early childhood educators as they respond to the needs of all children through their intentional practice toward a vision of children as capable learners. With two working parents in our family, access to high quality early learning for our children has been essential in helping us find balance between work and family. It also means so much to have our children's learning be supported in environments that reflect optimal, optimal play experiences, such as this natural outdoor environment that's offered in this play space and on the Mount St. Vincent University campus. This agreement announced today is helping to shape the future for Nova Scotians' youngest generation and their families. As a Canada Research Chair, I know this will have a meaningful and long-term impact on children's development, health and well-being. 
As a Nova Scotian, I know the focus on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility is critical to ensure that all families can find affordable and culturally responsive early learning and childcare. As a board member of Mount St. Vincent University's Child Study Centre, this agreement will help us to achieve excellence in early learning and childcare through an inclusive and high quality program and support our highly trained early childhood educators through our degree program and practicum experiences that we offer here at the Mount. As a, and as a mom, I'm excited about the focus on high quality early childhood education where my children and their friends will learn through play-based experiences and are supported by well-compensated and highly trained early childhood educators. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this historic announcement for early learning and childcare in Nova Scotia. I'm looking forward to seeing what the future brings for our children and families in the province. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McIsaac, for being with us today and the work that you do uh, in your research and the advocacy that you, that you provide on behalf of Nova Scotia uh, for our children. Uh, the next speaker uh, is, a, is a friend of mine. We get to travel around a little bit. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, it's always nice to, to get back to the mainland and see everybody. Minister Jordan, uh, thanks for, for being such a champion for the entire province. Uh, this is an important day for Nova Scotia, and I'm, I'm really honored that you could be with us today, and I'll ask you to come and say a few words. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is, uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit emotional about this announcement because it's going to be a game changer for so many women and so many families here in Nova Scotia. And I am so proud of the fact that we have gotten to this point today. So it's great to be here today. And I want to thank Premier Rankin and Minister Mumberkatch and, of course, to the Prime Minister. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us virtually. I can't wait to welcome you back to Nova Scotia. Minister Hussain, it's great to have you here as well. Um, and uh, welcome back to Nova Scotia. And, of course, uh, Jeff and, and uh, Patricia, who are also here in the crowd, and all of my Nova Scotia colleagues and, and uh, friends who are here uh, virtually, it is so great to be here today to make this announcement. It's a big day. And it's hard to understate what this agreement will mean for women in Nova Scotia. I can't help but think back of what this policy would have done for me and for my family 30 years ago. I had three children in my late 20s. And yes, I was a member of the three kids under the age of four club for one very long year. And when I had my first two children, the cost to put both of them in daycare for a year was more than my salary. I had to stay home. By the time I had my third child, I knew that if I wanted any type of career that was important to me, I had to get back to work. I couldn't have a seven-year gap in my resume. So I did, and we made it work, but it was hard. My husband and I juggled a combination of daycares, uh, after-school programs, sitters, and one child. if one child was sick from school or had a storm day, I had to take a vacation day. My story isn't unique. And it was a walk in the park compared to some of the families that have had to, what some families have had to overcome. I still wonder, how do single moms do it? How do parents whose children have special needs do it? How do they make this all work? And it's still women who bear the majority of the burden, and that's a fact. With the closing of schools and daycares this past year, women's participation in the labor force has dropped to its lowest in more than two decades. But today, I'm filled with hope. I'm excited for the next generation of women in Nova Scotia who will become mothers without having to worry about who's going to look after my children when I go back to work. An inclusive, high quality, affordable and flexible early learning and child care system will take away so much stress and financial strain for parents. It's going to make life better for so many women and families across Nova Scotia. But that's what governments are for. We're not here to maintain the status quo, but to envision and to plan and to execute policies that make lives better. We know what happens when societies have affordable childcare, when governments invest big in women and families. They see even bigger returns in workforce participation, economic prosperity, happier, healthier families. And that's what this agreement is going to mean for Nova Scotia. So I want to thank everyone here today, especially the Prime Minister. 
I would have to say it's a true honour to be part of a government that sees this as a priority. I'm also proud to be a Nova Scotian and see us leading the way in this country. So thank you, Premier Rankin, for that. But more than anything, I'm so proud to see what this is going to do for women in this province. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Jordan. Um, so we're, we're coming on the end, and I just want to provide, I just want to provide just a few remarks before, before we end. And as I said um, earlier on, Minister Hussein, when the announcement came that the federal government was going to invest significantly in, in child care across the country, I think you and I spoke that day, um, and the message from us was that Nova Scotia was ready. That we that the families were waiting, that we were that we were engaged with the sector, and that we wanted to we wanted to come to a deal sooner than later because families needed it. Um, and and I'm so honoured to be the minister of a department of dedicated staff who took, you know, the, the, they lost vacation days. They worked around the clock. Um, you know, we, we we asked a lot of them to, to get the deal done. And I want to recognise Kathy Montreal. She's here. Janet Lynn Huntington, Denise Stone, Sarah Malance, and, and Beth Kelly, who are a big part of our negotiating team. So, so to all of you, um, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's. I've been the minister now for approximately six months, and I'm just amazed by the work that you do and the department does every day to support children and families in, in the province. So, to all of you, this is your day as well. So, congratulations, uh, well done. Um, I also. Uh, I just, I, I, a lot of the comments have already been said, but I, I do want to say this, is that this is a game changer for this province, from Yarmouth to Sydney. Every family is going to have the same opportunity. Every child is going to have the same opportunity. There are ECE advocates in the community today. It's good to see you in person. It's always nice to have a conference. We've been doing a lot by Zoom, but to all of you, we had, we've had some conversations. I know you've been engaged with staff, and those conversations were around Affordability, it's coming. Wage support is coming. Support and training opportunities for ECE staff are coming. You are true heroes in this province. You look after our children every day, and you've looked after our children, and we've asked a lot of you in the most difficult times. So to my message to all of our ECEs across Nova Scotia is that we've listened, we'll continue to talk. This is also your day. This is a reflection of the work that you do to support families and children every day. So congratulations to all of you as well. And again, in conclusion, so honored, sir, to meet you in person. Uh, I hope we can have a conversation later today. Thank you for being with us, Prime Minister Trudeau. Again, thank you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Nova Scotia. Premier, uh, what a journey it's been. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud of you, not only as the Premier, but as my friend. Uh, this was a priority for you. Uh, I was hopeful we would get to this day, and here we are. We're changing a lot of lives uh, for families here in such a positive way. So that concludes the formal part uh, of uh, today's announcement. I want to thank everybody for being here again. Dr. Lumpkin, thank you for having us. Uh, and thank you to the children uh, who were there. It was great uh, to have them with us and all the ECEs that are here. Um, so thank you all very much, and uh, that concludes the formal part of today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Mauderkett. Um, just a reminder, for those, of, uh, for those outlets, we will be sending you the Zoom link uh, for the uh, availability, so you'll be receiving that Zoom link momentarily. Good afternoon, bonjour tout le monde. My name is Tina Thibault, and I'm the Managing Director of Media Relations for the province of Nova Scotia. I will be your moderator for today's media Q&A. Je m'appelle Tina Thibault, et je suis la directrice des... I'm the Director of Media Relations for the province of Nova Scotia. I'll be the facilitator for the question period today. We have allotted 30 minutes for the Q&A portion. Nous allons commencer la période de questions et réponses. So we'll start question now. We've got 30 minutes for it. Please limit yourself to one question. Afin de donner la chance à tous les gens de participer. So to give everyone a chance to participate, please, please limit yourself to just one question. From CBC. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks, uh, Premier. I'm wondering if you can expand on the process that's going to be used to examine ECE wages and benefits. Perhaps you can give an indication as to 
when they might actually see change. And Prime Minister, I'm wondering what you would say to folks who might be concerned that this coming becoming a reality is contingent on your government being reelected. So I guess I'll start there. So the, the comprehensive review has already started and we will have whatever decision we land on to make them more competitive and to value uh, their contribution. We want to make sure that we get it right and uh, we will have that effective by 2022, so next year. And that's why we gave the one-time uh, payment of $500 to all of them while that review uh, takes place. Thank you, John. This builds on work that we've done over the past many, many years. We started signing bilateral agreements on childcare, historic bilateral agreements with the provinces on childcare back in 2017, and have been focused on moving forward, on investing in childcare, in early childhood educators right across the country because this was so important to us. This pandemic has now highlighted for everyone, including uh, leaders in the business community, including people who hadn't been sold on childcare before, as how important it is. And uh, throughout it, we've heard from families, from moms, from uh, community leaders who've just consistently said, this is important. <clears throat> so we put it in our throne speech last year. Uh, we put it uh, in our budget just a few months ago and rolled up our sleeves and got to work uh, with Ian uh, and others uh, on making sure uh, that we were able to come to this as a reality. And this agreement is now signed uh, between the Government of Canada and the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, like it's signed with BC, uh, there is nothing that is contingent on uh, anything happening or not happening in the coming uh, months or year. Uh, this is going to be a reality for families across Nova Scotia, uh, for families across the country, because it's the right thing to do. And our focus as a government continues to be having Canadians' backs in every possible way. And as a uh, feminist government in what needs to be a feminist recovery, uh, child care is at the centre of that. Next, we'll go to Alicia Drouse from Global. Go ahead, Alicia. Thank you. France is now mandating the vaccines, uh, that vaccines are mandatory for all health care workers. So, Prime Minister, I'm just wondering if you think that that should be the case here in Canada. And Premier Rankin, I'm also wondering if there's any plans in Nova Scotia to require vaccinations for healthcare workers. Thanks for the question. Um, what we've seen right across the country from the very beginning is Canadians stepping up to get vaccinated in record numbers. We're leading the world uh, in terms of first dose and we're catching up very quickly uh, with the world leaders uh, in terms of fully vaccinated Canadians. Uh, it, it has been something that everyone has understood that to get through this, we need to get vaccinated. And I just want to, first of all, thank the millions upon millions of Canadians who've gotten vaccinated. Thank the great partnership with the provinces uh, that has led to getting these vaccines into arms right across the country and remind people that there's a lot more work to do. We need to get everyone vaccinated. The reality of the Delta variant and possibly the Lambda variant uh, are things that have uh, people really concerned. We're seeing uh, new spikes of cases uh, in Europe. Uh, we're seeing people take measures to try and catch up to Canada. Uh, the reality is we are going to continue to do what is necessary by giving Canadians the information, by making it easy to get vaccinated. And I am uh, certain that we're going to continue to see numbers climbing uh, across Canada as more and more people uh, get their full vaccination doses. So to your question on healthcare workers and all Nova Scotians, we've, we've taken since day one the education approach and that's worked uh, really well. We have uh, the highest uh, uptake of first doses in the country. Uh, so we're going to continue to use the education model. Uh, there is choice uh, when it comes to who uh, gets vaccinated, but we believe that uh, the vast majority, if not all healthcare workers, because they are so educated in knowing uh, the impacts of the vaccine and how to keep people safe, that they will get vaccinated. Next, we'll go to Frank Campbell from the Chronicle Herald. Go ahead, Frank. Thank you. Uh, this is for uh, Minister Hussein. Uh, just uh, curious about how uh, negotiations go back and forth for an agreement like this. Is, uh, is it about you trying to cajole uh, the province to give more money, and is there a formula tying 
provincial contribution to federal uh, contribution? It's from the very beginning, uh, it's been a collaborative approach. Uh, this has been a priority, of course, for our government from the very beginning, as the Prime Minister has said. But uh, thankfully, it's also been a priority for Nova Scotia, and I've had an amazing experience in negotiating with Minister Mumberket and uh, Premier, your leadership in this, uh, to get uh, to, to join us in this journey to deliver for families in Nova Scotia is, 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 is exactly the kind of thing that is needed to get us there. We've always said that this is our vision, but we, of course, uh, need provinces and territories to join us in this journey uh, to make sure that no child is left behind. This is about inclusion. It's about economic growth. It's about closing the gap between men and women in the labor market. It's about making sure that our kids have the best possible start in life. And it is an amazing, smart, amazingly smart economic policy in addition to being uh, a really good uh, social policy. So we've found in Nova Scotia uh, uh, an amazing uh, and collaborative partner. And our negotiations have been very, very fruitful. And of course, uh, that's why we're here today. Next, we'll go to Nathan Horn from All Nova Scotia. Go ahead, Nathan, if you have a question. Um, I, I do. It might be slightly unrelated to the exact topic, but is there any, for uh, Premier Rankin, um, is there any possibility of the mask mandate being lifted, perhaps prematurely? Should we see good numbers and continue to progress into the phases? Uh, no, but we are uh, relieving some of the mass requirements as of uh, tomorrow. Phase four starts. Uh, we've done a lot of work to get to phase four, credit to Nova Scotians. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to follow the plan laid out. And if we get more uh, percentages of second doses into arms uh, this summer uh, and public health is comfortable, then we'll start to look at that uh, in phase five. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the phone lines now for some questions. We'll take our first question from the phone line from Michael Tutton from the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> Prime Minister, um, some provinces have started to move towards vaccine passports. Others don't want to use them. Uh, but is there not a place for a federal vaccine passport that is standardized so provinces or businesses or any event that may want to use them has a standard known system to use voluntarily? Uh, that's a very good question. And from the beginning of this pandemic, we've worked hand in hand with the provinces. And we've had over 30 first ministers meetings since the beginning of the pandemic to make sure that we are aligned while at the same time respecting uh, the needs, the decisions, the focus of various jurisdictions on the situations that they've been, been handling. Uh, the provinces will be making determinations. As, as you point out, we've seen Quebec, for example, move forward with uh, a, an internal vaccine passport. Uh, Alberta has announced that it will not be doing that. Different provinces will be doing different things. Where the federal government has a role to play and where we are uh, looking is in terms of uh, vaccine certification for international travel. You will will know uh, that there are countries right now and countries in, in the past years that if you went to, you had to show proof of vaccination. I think certain tropical countries against certain uh, certain uh, rare diseases or tropical diseases uh, where you had to show proof of vaccination. Certainly, the federal government will be working uh, with the provinces to ensure that there is an internationally accepted proof of vaccination that will allow Canadians uh, to travel freely in the coming years. Uh, but in terms of domestic reflections on that, uh, that's something that uh, the provinces themselves uh, will establish as what is right for them. Going back to the phone lines, we'll go to Adrien Blanc, Radio-Canada. Go ahead, Adrien. Thank you. My question is for Premier Rankin. Uh, Monsieur le Premier Ministre, combien de Mr. Prime Minister, how many places uh, will be set aside for francophones and what are you going to do so that the linguistic rights of the francophone and Acadian community be respected? Uh, and francophones are one of those uh, in the category and we are going to continue to look at ways that we can have more equitable access to childcare. That is uh, the start of the conversation, but we are going to have a number of places. I don't know the number, but it, it, it amounts to thousands of new uh, places in early childhood education centres. And I don't have the breakdown of the regions, but we can certainly get you that information. I'd like to add that it was 
um, an element that there was in each of the uh, agreements we've signed so far, for example, British Columbia and Nova Scotia, as well as our discussions and negotiations throughout the country to ensure that our minority linguistic communities, official linguistic minority communities, receive the protection and the support necessary for daycare in their uh, minority language. It's important for us uh, that this be the case throughout the country. We'll always be there to define official languages and uh, French in particular uh, uh, in its minority situation throughout the country. Kate Bolango, Bologero from Bloomberg. Go ahead, Kate. Uh, I have a question a little bit different topic. Um, Cuba has made a mass arrest and appears to have shut down the internet on the island after people took to the streets in unprecedented numbers to denounce the government. Will Canada condemn the communist regime's repression of dissent, or do you agree with President Diaz-Canal that the U.S. embargo and Miami-funded mercenaries are to blame for the crisis? We, uh, as a country, Canada has always stood uh, in friendship with the Cuban people. Uh, we have uh, always uh, called for greater freedoms and more defense of human rights in Cuba. And we will continue uh, to be there to support uh, Cubans in their desire for uh, greater peace, greater stability, uh, and greater voice in, uh, in how things are going. Next, we'll go to Raymond Fillion from TVA Television. Go ahead. Thank you. Bonjour, Monsieur le Premier Ministre Trudeau. Uh, avec Good le variant, morning, Mr. Trudeau. With the Delta variant, there's some scientists that say that we need 90 to 5 percent of vaccine coverage to control a pandemic. I was wondering if your government is thinking of special measures in order to reach a level of 90, 95, for example, compulsory vaccination, which is being considered in France. So why not uh, a national uh, vaccine passport like Quebec is doing also? I think we are very aware of the fact that these new variants, in particular the Delta variant, are very concerning. We see this. We're seeing surges of COVID in several uh, European countries related to the Delta variant, even if they already had high rates of vaccination. That is why we're continuing to uh, repeat the message that in order to uh, uh, come back to a more normal uh, way of living in Canada, everybody should get vaccinated. We see every day hundreds of thousands of people being vaccinated. Vaccination is moving forward uh, quite uh, uh, quickly. We lead the planet in terms of uh, first and second dose vaccines. We do hope, and uh, we uh, not to have to make it uh, this uh, vaccination compulsory, because we see to what extent Canadians, uh, once given the proper information and the encouragement of doctors, their peers, and other community leaders, are uh, stepping up and getting vaccinated. So we will continue to encourage and find ways of uh, enticing Canadians to get vaccinated. Because, yes, even if we have now reached 80% uh, of uh, eligible Canadians having the first dose and 50% for two doses, we still have a lot of work to do to uh, get to a situation in the fall where we can have a more normal situation, a more safe situation for all. Rachel Haynes from CTV Ottawa. Go ahead, Rachel. Rachel, are you there? We'll go to Mackenzie Gray from CTV. Go ahead, Mackenzie. Hi, Prime Minister. Uh, Canada is one of the few countries that are mixing and matching Pfizer and Moderna. What assurances do you receive from European countries that require proof of vaccination for entry that someone in Canada who mixed and matched will be allowed in if they want to travel? First of all, all of our decisions around how to keep Canadians safe, uh, how to deliver vaccines uh, in an effective, safe way to Canadians is based on science, on research, on the best recommendations of the National Advisory Committee on, uh, on Immunization uh, and our top public health experts. So uh, looking at uh, data, looking at how to protect Canadians best, uh, we have taken uh, some strong decisions that quite frankly 
are bearing out. We're seeing record numbers of uptake of vaccinations. We're seeing a serious and sustained decline in cases. We have to remain vigilant because we know, as we've seen from, from places around the world, including some of our European friends, how easy it is to see a sudden spike, a resurgence, another wave of the Delta variant. So we cannot uh, let go of, of our vigilance. But at the same time, uh, we know, need to know that we're on the right track and we are going to continue to be on the right track with a combination of public health measures that still remain in place in most places across the country uh, in a carefully phased way, while also getting vaccines into arms as quickly as possible. Uh, regarding approval of vaccination certificates around the world, there's a lot of work being done. Uh, we've heard uh, a number of Canadians who living overseas express concerns that they've been vaccinated by uh, vaccines that haven't been approved in Canada, but were the first available vaccines available to them. Um, we're looking at what the WHO is certifying in terms of vaccines. We're looking at what other countries are doing around the range of vaccines. Our goal is to make sure that as many people as possible are protected as best as possible uh, over the coming days, weeks, months, and, and indeed years. Uh, and we're going to continue to work with the international community uh, to make sure that people who are fully vaccinated in ways that uh, Canadians recognize as uh, safe and effective uh, are also recognized around the world. Next, we'll go to David Lundgren from Reuters. Go ahead, David. David, are you there? Next, we'll go to Mia Robson from the Canadian yeah. Press. Mia, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, I'd like to ask you about Canada's review of its Global uh, Health uh, International Response Program uh, yesterday, or network yesterday that came out, and whether you will commit to implementing all 36 recommendations, whether you agree that it left Canada uh, sort of to lag behind in our initial pandemic response, and when we can start to see action on that. First of all, we welcome that report that we, we commission. We're going to look very carefully at uh, how we can move forward, not just in regards to that particular department or, or agency, but indeed uh, across the government to make sure we are better prepared for any future pandemics. Uh, much of our response back in the early months of 2020 uh, was helped by the fact that Canada had been through the SARS epidemic almost 20 years before and put in place a number of things. Obviously, this particular pandemic will have lots more lessons that we're going to draw on as we move forward. But I will remind you that as early as the beginning of January, uh, Dr. Theresa Tam was meeting with her, uh, her uh, counterparts across the provinces to talk about uh, concerns on this, uh, this uh, new novel uh, coronavirus that was appearing in, uh, in Wuhan. So we have been active on it. There's always things that we could have and should have done better, and we will certainly certainly uh, move forward on improving our whole range of systems so that uh, in the future, uh, governments will be even better positioned uh, to get through this pandemic than we were. Next, we'll go to David Aiken from Global. Go ahead, David. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Premier, Prime Ministers. Um, a, a bit of a double-barrel double question to both uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Rank, and I wonder, have the two of you, as leaders of Liberal parties, each of you, talked about the timing of the next Nova Scotia general election. And to the Prime Minister, you once joined Stephen McNeil on the campaign trail in Nova Scotia, at least once, maybe twice. I wonder if you've offered to pitch in and campaign for Premier Rankin if and when the writ is dropped. And Premier Rankin, I wonder if you've asked the PM to join you on the stump. And if not, I'd like to invite you to do so now if you'd like. And perhaps Premier Rankin, you'd like to respond first. That's very kind of you. I. Uh... No, we haven't had a personal conversation about election. Uh, today is about investing in Nova Scotians. That's what I've done in the, in the time that I've been Premier. I'm going to continue uh, to, to work on the priorities of equity, environment, and growing a robust economy as we, uh, as we start to get out of this pandemic. And uh, I can't say enough about the partnership over the last four months that we've had with the federal government on a number of fronts, not just those ones that I've mentioned. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm thankful to have such a strong partner. I'm going to continue to move forward as we uh, govern this province.
I, I entirely agree with Ian. First of all, no, uh, in all the conversations we've had, either bilaterally uh, or uh, as, uh, as part of the FMM calls over the past many, many months, um, the issue of elections has not uh, been something that we've talked about. Uh, we've been focused on how to continue to deliver for Nova Scotians and indeed for Canadians, how to continue to have people's backs, how to do the necessary work of getting through this pandemic while supporting Canadians, by supporting families, by supporting small businesses, by supporting women, and uh, rebuild better for the future. Lots of work to do, lots of conversations about what that work needs to be, uh, but our focus remains on delivering for people, delivering for Canadians, delivering for Nova Scotians by working together. And that's all the time we have for questions. This concludes today's event. Ceci conclut notre événement. Merci beaucoup.